name's Andy, and uh, my job is to get you excited about the topic that I've been enthused about for almost 40 years, chemistry. Now, I can tell by the look on your face, mate, I've got one heck of a job. But why is it that it's difficult to enthuse and excite people about chemistry? So, in my world, a number of people perceive chemistry to be very methodical, theoretical, um, and sometimes dull. And surveys of the general public have suggested that at school, pupils often perceive chemistry to be an abstract subject, and uh, with the principles difficult to get to grips with and such like. And this is actually supported by this Royal Society of Chemistry survey back from 2015 that showed, as you can read it, 25% of people say school put them off of chemistry. More recently, you may well have read that in terms of university applications for chemistry, they are down by over 20% in the last three years. Now, to me, that's really surprising. With so many interesting applications in our everyday lives, from how asparagus makes our wee smell funny, to how a clean copper coin can bring to life an old bottle of red wine. There are so many different applications. And what about those experiments that you've got to do at school? Is there anything better than making your own gooey slime, than dropping a mint into Diet Coke, or extracting DNA from a kiwi fruit? I think not. Chemistry surrounds us, and it plays a massive part in our everyday lives. From when we get up in the morning and clean our teeth, to making, baking, eating a cake, to washing our clothes and to making and drinking a milky brew before we go to bed. Now, with so many practical applications, why is it that people think chemistry is a theoretical subject? Well, maybe it's because people don't recognize that these applications involve chemistry. And let me give you one example, and that's the race for new antibiotics, an immensely important research area. Now, you may well associate that with medicine or biology, but actually, chemists are playing a leading role, and they will be at the forefront of new developments. And maybe at school, students don't always understand the applications of the chemistry that they're being taught, which to me, I think, is really, really important. However, a bigger, wider issue to me is how chemistry is portrayed in the media. So take, for example, this slogan here, taken from the internet, relating to a household cleaning product, steam cleaning, natural and chemical free. Now, as a chemist, that statement really bothers me. And I'm going to explain why. I'm going to break it down. Um, but the first thing I'm going to get you to do is to tell me what is a chemical, OK? So it's one in four choice. Is it? A, a harmful substance? Is it B, a distinct compound or substance? Is it C, something made in the lab? Or finally, is it D, an artificial substance often copying a natural product? What are you going to go for? B, fantastic. It is. A chemical is not necessarily harmful, and chemicals can be natural. They could also be artificial substances, and artificial substances are sometimes called unnatural synthetic or man-made chemicals and such like. Now on to chemical free. Okay, does anyone in the room know a product that is 100% chemical free? Well, let me give you some possibilities. Okay, so we've got a rose petal. Is that 100% chemical free? Maybe a newspaper. Maybe an organic moisturizer, and last but not least, we have salt. So which of those are chemical free? What do you think? None, thank you very much. They all contain chemicals. And back in 2010, when the Royal Society of Chemistry offered a million pounds to the first person to bring forward a chemical-free product, nobody claimed the prize. And that's because all products contain chemistry. Everything that we eat, drink, drive, play with, and live in contains chemicals. So you can certainly see in my world why the term chemical-free is very, very misleading. Now I want to talk about natural. 
Because advertising campaigns like this one suggest and promote the fact that natural chemicals are better for us than unnatural chemicals, okay? Well, is that true? No, not necessarily. Some of the most toxic chemicals that we know of are found in nature. And I'm going to give you one example, and this is the cassava root from which tapioca is made. Now, this plant produces a natural chemical called linamarin. And that natural chemical can break down to hydrogen cyanide, which you will all recognize as a very toxic, poisonous chemical, okay? So when making tapioca, to avoid people being poisoned by the hydrogen cyanide, that root needs really, really careful processing. So believe you me, not everything in nature is good for you. Indeed, you may well be surprised at what chemicals are present in common household natural products. Now, can anyone identify this common supermarket purchase from these lists of main key chemical ingredients? Anyone? No, look at the colours, yellow and the gas at the bottom. Something yellow fruit, anyone? Thank you very much. It is a... Banana, yes, well done. Bananas produce a gas called ethene, and that helps to ripen a number of other fruits. And that's why putting a banana going brown in a fruit bowl near apples will help to ripen those apples. And in my world, that's a great example of a chemical reaction in action. So you can see here, something as innocuous as a banana, this natural product contains a whole range of different chemicals, even some really interesting ones, including E numbers. Right. Still on the term natural. What's the difference between a natural chemical isolated from nature and that same chemical made in the laboratory? For this, I'm going to look at an example and I'm going to tell you about citric acid. Now, citric acid is found naturally in citrus fruits. It's commonly used as a preservative and a flavoring agent in things like foods and beverages, um, such as soft drinks and sweets. And those of you that like your sour candy, you will recognize it's very sour really, really acidic taste. Now, I could go and take a lemon and extract the citric acid from that lemon and purify it. Alternatively, I could go to the lab and I could make citric acid using chemicals not found in a lemon and purify that sample. So I've got two samples now of citric acid, one from the lemon, one from the lab. Are they the same or are they different? What do you think of the same. They are absolutely identical. They have exactly the same properties, including exactly the same effect on my body. So, you can certainly see I have an issue with chemical free. I also have an issue with the word natural, but I also want to talk about skin and its toxic properties. Now, does anybody know about the dihydrogen monoxide campaign? Put your hand up if you come across this before. Hey, a couple of you, brilliant. Starting in 1983, this campaign has periodically looked to ban this harmful chemical. And just look at what it does. And as a consequence of that, you may well say, Andy, why has that chemical not been banned today? Well, the reason why it hasn't been banned is because this is water. And what this example just shows us is that all chemicals, no matter what they are, can be harmful or fatal to us. And this brings me on now to the importance of the dose. The dose is the poison. And one way to compare the relative importance and toxicity of different chemicals is to look at that LD50 values. This is the lethal medium dose of a chemical, and that's which kills 50% of a sample population of an animal. Now, these values are not always perfect indicators, and they are controversial because of ethical issues, but nonetheless, these values are available, and we can use them today to compare the toxicity of different chemicals. Now, the Agatha Christie fans in the room will know, of course, that cyanide is a much more toxic chemical than water, and so you need much less sodium cyanide to have the same toxic effect as water. But, nevertheless, even water or steam at the appropriate dose can be fatal. So, you can see that that simple, innocuous statement in my world is extremely misleading. 
By the way, I am happy with the word cleaning and the word and. But it is misleading for the following reasons. Number one, steam is a chemical. It's gaseous water. Number two, natural steam is not better or worse than unnatural steam. They are identical. And number three, we should remind ourselves that all chemicals, no matter what they are, steam or natural products can be fatal and harmful to us, depending on the dosage. Now, what this example says to me is the importance of chemists educating and informing the general public about chemistry, ideally in entertaining and engaging ways, perhaps using storytelling, perhaps using humour. After all, why is it that chemists are so good at solving problems? It's because they have all the solutions. Boom, boom. Come on, it's not rocket science. Come on. Look at the tumbleweed. Okay. So what we're going to finish up with is how chemistry is helping us in our everyday lives today. Take a look at this picture here of this young child enjoying a great day out at the beach. I'm sure most of you in this room will have fond memories making sandcastles, playing in rock pools. So you might well say, Andy, how is this child benefiting from chemistry? Well, the first thing I want you to look at is the shorts and the cap. And these are made of polyester fibers. Now, polyester is a synthetic material made on the large scale in the chemical industry today. And I suspect most of you in your clothes, you will have polyester fibers. Why? Because it's very inexpensive to manufacture. Not that I'm saying you're wearing cheap clothes. I'm not saying that whatsoever. It's a very durable material. It's washable. doesn't fade. Very, very strong. The second thing I want you to look at there is the plastic, of course. Now, plastics are a very practical material, lightweight, durable. Again, very easy to make on a large scale in the chemical industry. But, quite rightly, plastics have had a bad press recently. I certainly understand the concerns over plastic pollution, but there is no doubt that plastics in my world have helped to make our lives better, healthier, and safer. And let me just give you some examples. Cycle helmets. Let me give you child, um, car seats in cars, car airbags, and see side bags and bags. But what I want to finish up with is how chemistry is going to help us in the future. Now, for this, I'm going to look at some research by some of my colleagues at York um, and talk about some of the work they're doing to help our everyday lives. Now, you may well know that if you get sunburn, it increases the likelihood of you getting skin cancer, and there is no safe, healthy way of getting a suntan. So with this in mind, some of my colleagues at York are developing new, more effective tests for looking at the effectiveness of sunscreens over long, extended periods of time. And the idea being that in the future, sunscreen bottles can then be labelled with a meaningful measure of the breakdown rate of those chemicals, so consumers will then know when to apply that sunscreen for maximum long-lasting protection. The other thing I want to come back to is plastic. The future of plastic is not in its complete demise, but in its reinvention as bioplastic. And indeed, some of my green chemistry colleagues at York are creating and evaluating new bio-based plastics. So these materials are made from renewable sources, that is, chemicals from trees, from plants, and the idea is at the end of their useful lifetime, these materials will be broken down. They are biodegradable, so they'll be broken down to water and carbon dioxide by microorganisms such as fungi and bacteria. Finally, I'd like to tell you about some of my atmospheric colleagues and their work with ozone and the sea's surface. Now, back in 2014, the World Health Organization told us that air pollution represents the single largest environmental health risk that we face. Now, in this respect, we know that ozone exists in the upper atmosphere, but it also exists at ground level. Unfortunately, at ground level, in high concentrations, ozone can be harmful to people. Now, in this respect, we know that the sea surface is important because ozone has broken down here, but as yet, we still don't have a detailed understanding of those processes. So, just three ways in which understanding chemistry better can help us in our everyday lives, but also help the planet too. Chemistry is all around us, as are chemicals, and I hope this presentation has hoped to paint a more positive image 
of what climate speed can offer us now and what it can offer us going forward. With this in mind, I'd like to leave you with my slogan, which I think wipes the floor with the previous one. For a brighter, cleaner world, think chemically! Well, hold on, hold on. Well, naturally. Thank you!